Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Julie Lithcott Hames, and on behalf of my very esteemed fellow panelists, Drs. Lisa Damore, Christine Yu Metier, and Rick Weisbord, we welcome you to this 315 session and are glad you made us a part of your afternoon. There are so many great offerings, and we're delighted you chose this. We're all grateful to Aspen for the opportunity to be here, grateful to you for entrusting us with your time. This panel is called The Kids Are Not Okay. I want to mention that earlier today, I think it was at 9, there was a panel that Lisa was on called The Kids Are Okay. <laughs> and uh, the person moderating that panel is like, I don't know about that 315 panel, The Kids Are Not Okay, because the kids are definitely okay. And I was sitting there like, yeah, it's two different topics. <laughs> the kids on that panel were very much okay, talking about Gen Z's use of technology and um, what they feel about technology. And they were so darn impressive. You just wanted to stand up and applaud these kids. They are very much okay, the kids, and yet this is a panel about youth mental health. And uh, let me just briefly set the stage. From the media everywhere to our Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, perhaps within your own family, youth mental health feels like a crisis and it feels like no one is helping. So we want to make our time here today forward-looking, hopeful, and constructive, because we've got you. Could you raise your hand if you are a parent? Put your hand down. Could you raise your hand if you are concerned about the mental health of any child or young adult that may be in your life, whether they're your own or they don't belong to you? OK. So we've got you. This is going to be useful and hopeful and helpful. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to start by framing the issue, tell you what is and isn't happening, to whom, talk a bit about what's causing it, this crisis in youth mental health. Then we'll get to some specifics on what we can do about it. We're going to make sure you get some good follow-up resources. We're going to take your questions along the way so you feel seen and supported around the topics that may be of concern to you, all done in the remaining 42 minutes and 27 seconds. <laughs> so let's go. Y'all, we couldn't ask for a more qualified or thoughtful panel of experts. Dr. Christine Yu Metier, Dr. Lisa Damore, Dr. Rick Weisbord. They're going to explain who they are and what they do. Christine, will you start us off? Sure, thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm Christine Moutier, and I serve as the Chief Medical Officer at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. I'm a psychiatrist, and I am also someone with lived experience. And I have um, young adult children in their 20s, and they are open about the fact that they have had their own struggles. Um, at AFSP, we are a national organization, so we are tens of thousands of people who have all been personally and sometimes professionally affected by suicide across all 50 states through our chapter network. It is a movement. It's a time when science is finally informing change so that we can talk about these things. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today, these are not new experiences. Yes, there are issues certainly going on during the pandemic, but there has been a public health crisis related to mental health in our nation and certainly for youth for a long time before that. So anyway, I'll stop there, but I'm um, really pleased to be here and looking forward to getting into it. I'm Lisa Damore. I'm a clinical psychologist, and my work focuses on adolescents. And in particular, I focus on the relationship between teenagers and younger children, but mostly teenagers, and the adults around them. And what I do in my work is I try to help adults understand the developmental stages that kids are going through, what is natural to development in kids, and then also how to connect with them, to work with them, to talk with them in ways that actually strengthen the relationship, protect against mental health concerns, and especially to do so around very delicate topics, around very emotionally charged moments. And um, I think for me, you know that thing, location, location, location in real estate? For me, in mental health, it's relationships, relationships, relationships. And for me, when I think about kids, it's relationships with the adults who are in their environments and working to shore those up and support those adults. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to, great, great to see you. And I'm so delighted there's interest in this topic. 
Uh, my name is Rick Weisbord. I'm on the faculty at the Ed School and the Kennedy School at Harvard. I'm a psychologist. For many years, I was the director of the Human Development Psychology Program, and I run a program called Making Care in Common. And Making Care in Common is rooted in our research, which indicates that the degree to which we have elevated these aspects of success, achievement, and happiness as the primary goals of child raising and demoted concern for others, concern for the common good, concern about justice. And we are trying to put front and center in child raising, again, concern for others, concern for the common good, concern about justice. The problems we are having in the, our country right now have many sources, but I think one of them is the degree to which we have marginalized caring for other people and caring for people who are different from us. We do a lot of work with schools and parents to support them in cultivating kids' capacity to care across difference, which is, I think, a foundation of justice. Um, these relationships, I also think, are central to mental health. That if we are, enable our kids to have caring relationships with each other and with the adults in their lives, um, they are protected against a range of mental health problems. We are also embarking on a three-year project to understand the drivers of the mental health crisis we're in. Thank you. Thanks so much for those introductions. I will add that I am not an educator in the field of psychology, a psychologist, psychotherapist, or psychiatrist. My stance here is that of a former college dean where I observed the rising poor mental health in college students and decided to write a book about what I was seeing, specifically the ways in which certain elements of parenting were contributing to what we were seeing in young people. I was happy to tell parents what to do differently, only to discover that in my own house, with my own kids, I was making the very mistakes that I was critiquing other people for. So I'm now this person who's a lot more humble, a lot more curious about what we can all do to support our kids in thriving. Rick, will you start us off with the next question? This is um, you know, the, the opportunity to really frame the issue. There's a lot of noise and chatter about this crisis in youth mental health. Can you tell us, from your perspective, what's happening and to whom? And then Lisa and Christine, you'll follow. Yeah, great. So um, the, the mental health crisis began long before the pandemic. It, it seems to have began around 2008. You see this big spike in depression and anxiety and suicidality, and you see it across race, culture, and class. About 40% of young, there's a 40% increase between 2008 and 2019 in the number of young people who are teenagers who are reporting persistent sadness and hopelessness to the degree that it's interfering with their lives. Um, girls are about two to three times more likely than boys to suffer from depression. LGBTQIA students have been highly vulnerable, are suffering depression, anxiety, much higher rates than the general population. Um, the pandemic has ag exacerbated all of these problems. And, uh, you know, an unknown poet has said, this is the same storm, but we've been in different boats. And low-income kids have been very different boats than affluent kids have been in. Uh, the amount of grief and trauma in low-income communities is entirely different than in affluent communities. Among my students, among my low-income students, almost everybody has lost somebody close to them. Among my affluent students, it's very rare to find somebody who has lost somebody who's been close to them. So I think this is a story about race and class in part. It is also a story about access to services. Affluent kids seem to be suffering about the same rates of depression and anxiety and substance abuse as low-income kids, despite the many stresses that low-income kids um, endure. But the causes are different and the consequences are different. I live in Boston, and Boston may have the highest per capita number of therapists per kid in the country. I cannot find, my wife and I have a hard time finding a therapist for um, our kids' friends. I mean, there's a terrible shortage of therapists in places like Boston and New York. Mm -hmm. um, there are vast parts of their country where kids do not have access to services. In low-income communities, it is shameful and criminal, the lack of access to services that kids have. So I would really encourage us in this discussion to focus in part on that population. I'm gonna just build from what you said. I mean, I think absolutely COVID was an accelerant. You know, kids who were suffering suffered more. Kids who were well-supported and protected, I think, you know, by and large got through okay. Um, but we are sitting now in this access issue and access for care, and I have the same thing. I mean, I couldn't have a better network for referral, and I cannot find clinicians for 
the kids I want to find clinicians for, which means that as we think about solutions, we're going to have to think about scalable interventions that are already available. And I think one of the challenges is it takes a long time to become a good clinician. And so even if today we decided we were going to triple the workforce of mental, it's going to take 15 years to get, that's not going to work. So we need to think much more on the ground and scalable. Um, the only thing I'm just going to throw in there, and this has flown so completely under the radar, and I think it's important for people to know, one of the good things that came out of the pandemic is that at least in psychology, we created a national license, which we've never had before. And so I have applied for it, took a week of my life because I have to dredge out all of my stuff from graduate school to apply for this license. Um, I can now practice in all of the states that have legislated into this, which at this point is like nearly 34 states. And so things like this, which are flying below the radar, still being figured out, will make things like access for kids in very rural areas possible, access for highly specialized care possible in a way that was never true before. So it's been very, very grim. I will not in any way minimize that, but there are some things that have percolated up through this that we can look to in a hopeful way. Further thoughts on framing the topic, Christine? Yeah, my, my framing starts with the fact that as human beings, we all have physical health and mental health, and it's very integrated. We, it, it's very dynamic. Um, we've got our genetics, we've got our environment, our relationships, all of that matters very much. Some people will also have a predisposition for mental health conditions, just like some people do with physical health conditions. And so it's not one or the other, you know, relationships and support or clinical treatment that's important. It is all of the above um, for different people at different times. So that, then also over, um, like Rick said, since about 2007, the rate of youth suicide has been increasing year over year. 2019 was one glimmer of hope exception, but during 2020, when the rest of the nation actually saw a decrease in the national rate of suicide, believe it or not, for the beginning of that pandemic period, youth and young adults rate actually rose. Um, so, and, and so this is, it's hard to talk about all this because every person and every subgroup, we're all very different, facing different kind of unique vulnerabilities and environmental kind of stressors and opportunities. But you know, I think about, um, I think about minoritized youth, I think about LGBTQ youth, I think about youth in the foster system, the welfare system and juvenile justice. And, and, and layer those experiences on top of the universal experience as human beings where we feel we have the tendency to compare ourselves to others and feel different until we begin that dialogue and that opening up. So I, you know, I think this conversation is gonna be very broad, but I think we're gonna to try to get to sort of a framework for what can elevate all of the above. Um, elevate you know, and optimize mental health but also potentially address and mitigate suicide risk. I really appreciate hearing your thoughts on who's impacted uh, the various populations that are uh, most underserved in our nation, not surprisingly, are um, over impacted when it comes to poor mental health. I'm raising my kids in Palo Alto, California, which is a very affluent community, and frankly became well known to those who didn't already know it because we had not one but two suicide clusters um, among teenagers in our public high school community uh, in the past decade. And it leaves a parent, oops, sorry, it leaves a parent, it leaves educators, it leaves clinicians yearning for an answer to why. Mm -hmm. Why is it that our youth, full of promise, in a place full of opportunity, now I'm talking about privileged kids, but the larger question applies to all. Why do some feel such degrees of hopelessness or helplessness about their future? And so let's turn to that question of cause. I'm not sure we have a real, uh, what do you call it, causation sense of cause, but we might have correlation. I don't know, you can tell me. What, what are the causes of the troubles that we're seeing our young people have? Anyone, please. <laughs> Jump in. Should I start? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think um, one thing to get away from are, are generic causes. I mean, I hope we get into a conversation about social media, but social media has, I think, been a piece of this puzzle, one piece of the puzzle, and there have been many pieces to the puzzle. I also think that the causes vary so much by community. You're in Palo Alto, an affluent community's achievement pressure, an escalating achievement pressure. 
is a, is a huge issue. And low income communities, intergenerational poverty and despair, and in communities of color, persistence of racism and racial violence over, over the last couple of years. So, you know, there are very different causes in different communities. I talk to a lot of young people um, who have been traumatized by the Trump administration. And, you know, we'll say, and part of the sessions this morning address this issue, that the amount of disillusionment they feel, like adults don't have their hands on the wheel, things are spinning out of control, the amount of cor corruption. But this spike in mental health problems began in 2008 when Obama was president. So that's when we really started to see this steep rise in depression and anxiety. So it's a more complicated issue than that, and Republican kids, Trump supporter kids, are also suffering high rates of depression and anxiety and suicide. So I'm just trying to complicate the picture because I think it is complicated. Yeah. So, yeah. so the American Psychological Association has done a very good job of surveying youth and looking at mental health questions, and pre-pandemic, as they were seeing this rising rate, they had young people reporting things like fears about the climate, concern about political polarization, fears about gun violence. So our adolescents and children are in no way insulated from these large, frightening events that surround all of us. And um, I think they are very aware that they're stuck with this for a long time, that this is landing on them in a different way than it's gonna land on the older generations. And so it, you know, in some ways, a lot of what we do in psychology with collecting data is we get what we call duh findings, right? Like, well, duh, of course they would feel that way. But we do have that, and we've documented that from prior to the pandemic. And then, you know, there's so much to say about the pandemic, but the, the short piece I can say on it, especially for teenagers, is that teenagers have two jobs. You know, one is to spend as much time as possible with their friends, and the other is to become increasingly independent. And the pandemic seemed uniquely designed to undermine their ability to do the two jobs right. that are central to their right. development. Let me complicate it further to use your language, Rick. Some people, nobody here I'm sure, but <laughs> elsewhere, people are criticizing young people for perhaps over-dramatizing their emotional needs. They call them snowflakes around their uh, claims of feeling anxious or depressed. And, um, there's, there's some out there really saying, is this really an issue or are those kids just hypersensitive, responding to these surveys and ticking a box? The rest of us who felt precisely the same way would never have ticked. Can I just jump in on this? Because yes. this jump is, in. I think while there may be that, that that phenomenon exists somewhere where there's a sense of entitlement and needing to just vent, 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 much, much more so than that, there is an a hyper sense of self-sufficiency and stoicism so that it is not, does not feel safe to many, many people and, and all of us at different times to express our distress out loud, to give it words, to take the risk to trust somebody and actually open up because it feels vulnerable and scary. And so I actually am far more worried about the majority of kids and young adults who are experiencing things but haven't found that safe space yet. We see things like among black youth, the rate of suicide is rising the steepest. And what we're seeing in that population is a jump from looking like there are no issues except for maybe disciplinary issues at school because mental health issues are you know, um, discriminatorily addressed in different populations so that um, a young person of color is much more likely to be punished and go from in, into that school to prison pipeline um, than are white kids. And so I'm, I'm very much more worried about the culture around being able to express, but again, in ways that are productive, than I am about this dismissal that we just have you know, too much emotions being expressed. I, I really take umbrage with that. Well, just in the interest of complicating it a, a little Even bit. Even further. <laughs> um, I, I totally agree with Kristen. We got a big problem, which is real suffering out there. Mm -hmm. This is not manufactured suffering. This is real. It's uh, large majorities of kids. I do think we live in a country where there's more psychological talk going on right now than in any country in the history of humankind. Um, and that's true of teenagers as well. Um, they have a much bigger, generally, a much bigger vocabulary for talking about their emotional life. And I think, uh, by and large, that is a great thing that they can talk 
about that people can identify feelings, articulate feelings much more commonly than they did in previous generations. I also have some worry about it. I worry that it causes people to turn their inner life sometimes into theater. And, um, and again, sometimes. Um, and to become, to inflate their own feelings and to organize their identity around those feelings. So again, I, I want to re re reiterate the big point here, which is that we have real suffering affecting huge numbers of kids. But I do think particularly in affluent communities, I see this, and I think it's born, I want to say one thing really quickly. You know, sometimes I go to playgrounds and I see in my neighborhood, which is middle class affluent, I see parents noting their kids every 10 minutes. That must make you sad, that must make you frustrated, that must make you angry. It's like the mood police are out, the mood meteorologists are out. <laughs> and I do worry about that because, you know, if those parents were getting those kids focused on other kids' feelings, mm -hmm. they would have better relationships their whole life. Mm -hmm. um, this focus on the self can be damaging. Mm -hmm. When I was pregnant with my now 18-year-old daughter. I was out to hear pregnant, and I was in supervision with a senior colleague, and she said, do you want to hear how psychologists, and she didn't say screw up, but she said screw up their kids, and I was like, yes, tell me how, and she said, they talk too much about their feelings. Mm. That, you know, the kid is having a meltdown, oh, tell me about your, you know, as opposed to that shoring up. And so we have to really try to find a balance of both being responsive and aware and attentive and validating, but not tipping it toward rumination, which well, we know yeah. can be problematic. Lisa, I'm sorry to, mean to cut yeah. you off, but what I want to say is I'm coming to you on that. Okay. I want you Here to I tell am. us, um, the three of you uh, know better than anybody what works. Lisa, can you walk us through your framework <laughs> of the various levels at which support or proactive efforts can be offered? And then, Christina and Rick, you can follow. Sure. So I think, you know, as we get into the details of the crisis, it can feel overwhelming. And one of the ways when I start to feel overwhelmed as I think about it is I fall back on models we've had in public health forever in terms of primary, secondary, and tertiary intervention. So primary prevention is things we do for everybody. So it's, if, we if we took it to oral health, that's the fluoride in the water. Secondary prevention is when we identify an at-risk group. So that would be kids who are likely to get cavities. And then tertiary prevention is when there's already somebody who's suffering, so a kid who's got a cavity. So we can take that same model and use it to think about how we're going to tackle this mental health crisis. So I'll spool out the primary prevention piece a little bit, because that's where I sit. So I work in this space of relationship between adults and kids. And one of the things I think we can do right now that will make a meaningful difference in terms of how to be more helpful to kids, and this gets exactly to the point we're making here, is to get really, really clear about what mental health is. And the definition of this has gotten a little bit off track. And the definition that has started to emerge, or I would say actually has emerged pretty strongly in the last 10 years, is that you know you're mentally healthy, you know your kid's mentally healthy if they feel good, right? If you're feeling good and your kid's feeling good, then you've got mental health. This is not a way that we have ever defined mental health. And a way that we can think about it that actually I think helps reassure and then also direct us, is to remember that mental health is actually about having the right feeling at the right time, a feeling that makes sense in its context, and then managing the feeling effectively. Managing the feeling in a way that brings relief and does no harm, as opposed to managing the feeling in a way that actually deepens it or causes harm. And so one thing we can do right away is to get much more at ease with the idea that distress is part of life, it is absolutely part of development, it is absolutely part of adolescent development, and come off the ceiling about the fact that kids are gonna be in distress. And they're gonna be in distress because of normal events, they're gonna be in distress because of the pandemic, and then over here, we have the kids who are suffering and need intervention. But a lot of how we react to kids, you know, whether we're being validating or getting too deep in, can go really, really far. But it, one thing we can do right away is to not be frightened of kids' distress. And I think that kind of crouched in a defensive posture that I see a lot of us in is um, making it worse. So that's a primary thing we can do today. But let me just, yeah. the add-on is, so, so what does the proper response look like when you have that kid in what may just be normal distress? So, or you're trying to suss out whether it's okay distress or problematic distress. So the way I think about it, and the way, I mean, this is, comes from the field. So we, the term we use is emotion regulation, which is the most boring term in the world for the most important thing um, out there. 
And emotion regulation is the ability to actually withstand an emotion effectively. And the way we can think about it as the adults who are around young people is we have two sets of tools. Sometimes you can regulate an emotion by expressing it, talking about it, going for a run, you know, banging things, you know, all of those things can provide relief. Usually expression works until it doesn't. And this is what you're getting at, you know, this idea that sometimes expression can actually exacerbate. When expression isn't working or it's not what the kid is inclined to do, we have another set of tools that doesn't get talked about nearly enough, which is about bringing emotions back under control, right? Finding comforts, finding distractions, going and making yourself useful, right? <laughs> Things like that. So what I would say is, as the adults surrounding young people, if expression is working great, if expression's not working, go to these other ways that we can help kids get things under control. If that's not working, call for help. Okay. Let's turn to Rick and Christine on this primary level. Anything to add there? If not, we'll move to the secondary and tertiary levels. Uh, I, I would say, on the, I'm sorry, Christine, the, did you want to? No, no, no. Oh. <laughs> you're, you're already in GOAT. <laughs> Um, I would say on the primary level, um, a couple things. One is I don't think we're going to therapize, or, or we need more therapists, but we're, at least as I said, we're not going to therapize or medicate our way out of this problem. Um, and we really need to think about prevention and how to get kids connected to adults who care about them. There are a huge number of kids who are isolated, lonely, disconnected from adults, and we need to be intentional and proactive about this. So one thing we do in, in our schools is a relationship mapping strategy where you ask all the adults to identify those kids they have a caring, trusting relationship with. And by default, you see all the kids that don't have a caring, trusting relationship. And that becomes the map. And then you make sure that all those kids are connected to an adult. And I'm using that as an example of what I think needs to be primary interventions. Adults of many kinds, all of us really need to step up and not depend on therapists to solve this problem, but to create the kind of relationships that are going to be protective. You've also talked about the imperative that kids have some kind of purpose or something outside of themselves yeah. that is. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. The, um, you know, I think for many kids, it's more therapeutic to be helpful than to be helped. Um, and that doesn't mean that a lot of kids don't need to be helped. But when we get kids to attach to things larger than themselves, when we get them um, to help others in meaningful ways. We have terrible problems in the world. When we get them engaged in solving those problems, that can be ther very therapeutic for a lot of kids. And it's, good, and it's good for the world. The self by itself is a poor site for meaning. Most of us find meaning in our connections to others and often by helping others in some ways. So that's you know, a big you. part of it. Yes, that's right. Christine. It's adults and it's also peers. So yeah. young people know when their peers are suffering and they take their responsibility as a friend actually very seriously. So we heard from them that they wanted to know what to do and how to open up that safe and supportive dialogue. So there is an ad campaign called Seize the Awkward that we worked with the Judd Foundation and the Ad, Count, ad Council on and it provides a whole bunch of tools um, that, that you can go to and just uh, use and learn. And, and I would say that is actually kind of a primary prevention because that's creating a skill set within the community of young people so that they can do what they want to do and what they're naturally poised to do, which is to support one another. Um, and then the other thing I'll mention in terms of, well, it's probably all layers of primary, secondary, and tertiary. Yeah, take us there. Is that pediatricians are, are on the front line and have not been trained in mental health, but really are by default, um, well, it felt like they were drowning in it certainly these last couple of years. So the American Academy of Pediatrics partnered with my organization, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, to create a whole bunch of tools for pediatricians. Um, and so if, just a practical tip, if you're a parent and you're not sure where to start and you're really worried about your, your child, and, and you don't have a therapist or a mental health professional you know, lined up and ready to go, I would start with that pediatrician. And don't assume that just because they're primary care that they won't be able to dive in um, and start that dialogue and actually do quite a bit potentially um, on their own, let alone with referral. And one thing I'll mention as well that's, that's definitely tertiary, but um, most people don't realize that pediatricians have access to child psychiatrists in most states by a phone call. There is a network that's set up 
to, to allow for that real-time consultation. So there are some resources, there are probably more than, um, than we realize. Mm. Any more on, the, on what secondary or tertiary level support looks like? Well, from a secondary standpoint, and this is, this is probably kind of primary and secondary, there are mental health um, support and education programs going on in faith communities, in barber shops and salons. Uh, we have a partnership with um, doing suicide prevention education work in black churches. So there, you know, I think the idea is where, where we are in our communities, that's where we must embed um, you know, and, and needs to be customized, actually. Mm -hmm. the, the dialogue um, has to include uh, those who are in the community. You know, the saying that nothing for us without us, and I'm almost embarrassed that on this panel we don't have I a know. young person and yeah. we want to hear from yeah. anyone in the room um, when we have time for that. Yeah, I would, I would just add, I totally agree with Christine's last comment about being youth-led in, in this. Um, I also think, you know, we have a problem of hopelessness, of young people not having hope. I don't know if any, have you, any of you have seen in nihilism. I don't know if any of you have seen euphoria. I don't know if you're going to be able to bear seeing euphoria. But it's a lot about hopelessness and nihilism, and a lot of young people are saying in our focus groups that they really relate to it. And so it raises this critical question for us, which is how do we cultivate hope in young people? And I think we do it in part when they feel like they can impact problems that they care about. And when they trust us, and they trust us to be really working diligently to confront problems in the world that they're seeing right now, I think those are going to be the big levers for hope. We're going to open it up to your questions. I'm going to try to take about eight or nine minutes of questions and then come back to the panelists for um, some final thoughts. So who, yes, in the back. Yep. Here comes a microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, John Haidt, um, Rick said that we were going to maybe come back to social media, and so I'd like to force that yes. right now. Yes. Um, and, and Rick also said that the, pro that the problem begins in 2008. Now, if you look at the suicide statistics, that looks to be true, but that's in part because uh, there's a three-year dip in suicide before that. If you look at anxiety, depression, and self-harm, those are pretty level until 2012, 2013. So that all seems to go up around 2012, 2013. This happens across races, across countries. The exact same thing happens in Britain and Canada at the exact same time. It hits girls the hardest. It hits preteen girls the hardest. Why is this? What could cause a global effect that hits preteen girls the most? And given that the girls themselves say it's social media, the correlational evidence is very, is very consistent. The experiments are there. Facebook's own research says it. So, you know, like if all signs point to this one thing as the murderer, why are you reluctant to say maybe it's social media? Oh, no, I, I wasn't. Yeah, John Haidt has just written a beautiful article in The Atlantic uh, about this. Thanks for sharing that perspective, Yeah, thanks John. for sharing it. I think there is, my understanding is there's a big debate in the research literature about whether this began in 2008, 2013. But we can, we can come back to that. Um, I wasn't, I, I didn't mean to say that social media wasn't an issue. It is an issue. It's a, it's a significant piece of the problem. I am reluctant to say it is the problem, because I think the problems vary so much in the ways that I described across race, class, culture. And that social media, and you know this, you know more about social media than I do, is really complicated in a lot of ways. It's, you know, it's working for some, it's helping kids in a lot of ways, and it's hurting kids in other ways. Lisa and Kristen talk, know a lot about this too. So what, what yeah, I mean, and I think this sort of goes back to, you know, letting the kids tell us what they're finding. And I, I was with a teenager not long ago. She said, I love my phone and I hate it too. You know, and, and I think that when we, we scrape away at this, what we find is there's probably not a kid on the planet who's engaged with social media for whom it's not both simultaneously good and bad. And I think what we're really, really needing to try to tease apart is how do we minimize the harms that we do know um, or seem highly implicated from social media while also maximizing the degree to which it helps kids connect. I mean, I, I think through the pandemic, I can't imagine how we would have functioned if, we, if that had happened when we were adolescents and we had no way to be in touch with our peers. And so I think, um, you know, back to the panel this morning, I mean, these were young people talking about doing extraordinary things using online platforms. Um, it's messy. It is really messy. And what I would say, and this just gets back to the stuff I know, which is how to talk to kids about this. If you ride up on a teenager saying, oh, that terrible social media, you know, 
the conversation's over before it's even started. Mm -hmm. If you say to a teenager, talk to me about social media in your life, how is it working? Where is it helping you? Where is it making you feel worse? And you get them on board with that exploration, your chances of them shifting how they talk and think about it in their own lives go way up. Um, social media absolutely is a mixed bag. However, the, the negative findings in the research are very, very clear. And I think the, the rub comes between a for-profit enterprise that's being driven by algorithms that drive um, engagement some of which is exactly what is detrimental to vulnerable youth in terms of eating disorders, image, comparison game, mm -hmm. feeling of exclusion, um, depression, anxiety, all of those things being worsened. So there, I, I really believe we do need to come together and do something about this as a society. There is an example of a piece of legislation that's in the Senate right now called the Kids Online Safety Act, COSA, that um, I, I think we should all support. It basically begins to hold the companies accountable to be uh, for public health scientists to be able to access that data um, and also hold them accountable for the social good and, and the harm that's being done. So I just want to put that out there. That's on us, and we, we can all sign on to say to you know contact our um, policymakers to say please sign on to COSA because it's early. It does not have enough members signed on yet. And let me add that we have to examine our role as parents. The smartphone came online in the fall of 2007 and we began using it yes. to perform our lives. And we began using it to surveil our kids every move. And we began using it to access parent portals to find out, did my kid turn on their homework today? What grade did they get on this quiz today? There isn't yet a study from the field of psychology correlating those behaviors with anxiety and depression in kids. But I predict it's coming. Because heretofore, the only people surveilled 24-7 were incarcerated people and people in psychiatric facilities who had given up their right to privacy because they were considered a harm to themselves or others. And now it is routine in American childhood, also in this same era. Yes, right here. You, no, you, right, you, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so when we're lucky, we all know that public health is prevention, not cure. And I'm curious if there are any uh, studies showing that in elementary ages, um, what might be being done, whether it's by parents or communities or teachers, that is leading to less incidence of teenagers with suicidal ideation, depression, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's one example called the Good Behavior Game, which is a classroom management system that teachers and schools sign on to. And the kids who, in kindergarten and first grade, were exposed to the good behavior game system, studied out 15, 20 years later, um, were shown to have less of all of the bad things and um, you know, higher rates of employment and, and so forth. And what the good behavior game essentially does is helps promote self-efficacious behavior so that kids learn that I can control my own actions. And that when I, when I practice and grow that muscle, that it leads to my own sense of self-esteem and that can kind of snowball on itself. Um, versus you know, the kids who, who have those vulnerabilities, when they're not exposed to that, they're getting in trouble over and over again um, in a way that, that sends them down the, the opposite path towards those higher risk behaviors. Can we just add, like, really smart investment? Yes. Um, she asked, isn't that a very smart investment? I, that is, to me, that we need all layers. And it, it, it involves in engaging schools. You know, right now in our nation, we, we've got, frankly, it's a battle. Because we have these, these programs and, and simply so, social emotional learning curricula being incorporated into schools, which is a very good thing, is being confused and conflated into, and being politicized into something that it isn't. So, I mean, yes, the, these kind of primary prevention public health strategies in schools, in faith communities, teaching parents, all of that is well worthwhile. And we have yet to scale it up as a nation. We just haven't done that yet. Yeah, and, and, before, and before kindergarten, too. Zero, I just want to make a pl plug for early childhood. Zero to five, too. I mean, parents, depressed parents of infants, we know, are more likely to become depressed later. So, I mean, the work has to begin at birth. And, and, can I go back here to the back row, the V-neck, yes. Hi, Jasmine Ramirez. I'm a school board director at a school district about 45 minutes down Valley, rural Colorado. Um, 
our high school, the high school in my district specifically has 1,007 students, 54% of them are Latino. When I ran, um, some of the complaints I got from the students were um, other students wearing 40 border patrol hats and Trump mm -hmm. logos on the school grounds. And so my question is, as school district members, as school districts, as teachers, what can we be doing actively to make sure that education doesn't further add to the mental health mm. of our students? Mm. So. That must be really hard to deal with. Yes. yes. Thank you for sharing yeah, yeah, that yeah. story. Yes. And thank you for being here. Um, so one of the challenges we have in education is to teach kids about civil discourse. Right, and, and civil discourse is extraordinarily complicated. It requires a lot of emotional control. It requires a lot of empathy. It requires a lot of curiosity. I think civil discourse is teachable. I think what's really hard is they're not seeing a whole lot of it around them in the adults. And so I think um, we need to grapple with the fact that if it's going on among the adults around them, it's not it's very hard then for us to ask kids to come to school acting differently than that. I would just add one thing. I mean, first of all, I, I really appreciate the question and I want to just give a shout out to, cheat, to teachers and educators around the country because mm -hmm. uh, teachers and educators are leaving the profession in droves. They've been underappreciated, underheralded during this time. Um, I also, uh, what was I wanted to make another point? What was the other point I wanted to make? Um, I'm gonna cut. It's okay. We'll come back. back to it. You know where we're headed now is the rapid fire final thing. Yeah. Okay. Twenty seconds to each of you on each of three questions. Oh. No pressure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of people under this tent who want to do good in the world and who have access to a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. So if money is the solution, uh, what would you tell people to direct their money toward? Twenty seconds each of you. Go for it. Wow, well, in 20 seconds. OK. Um, well, like we've been talking about, there are, this is layered. Not, one thing is not actually going to, do, to take care of the whole picture. So I think we need funding that is strategic and sustained in this public health framework that addresses the, 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 ground, the level setting, um, universal education right now we have a problem that people don't really even know how to define the difference between the fact that we all have mental health, we all have feelings, but when is it time to actually seek professional help? That is still very unclear to, to most Americans. So I, I think we need a sustained um, you know, tertiary uh, care strategy. Thank you. Um, parents and teachers are on the front lines, caregivers. I think everything we can do to support them in terms of resources about how to help kids when they are struggling, how to have a trauma-informed teaching um, is hugely important. So trauma-informed training and also then just all around coaching on helping kids with emotion regulation goes very, very far. Thank you. I remember what I was gonna say. Go, <laughs> go, ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Rick, you're good. What I, what I was gonna say is I think we all as educators, and I feel as you know, educating college students, grad students, have this, have this strong desire, we're worried about kids falling behind and we wanna catch them up and we do need to catch them up. But Everything I'm hearing is they need to be feel embedded in relationships before they're going to be able to do that and that we really need to spend the time developing those relationships. So that's what I was going to say early in the school year um, and assuring that all kids feel a sense of belonging. In, in, in terms of your um, question, where, where to spend money, uh, I am mainly worried about low-income communities and many communities where there are no mental health services. And I think we need to spend money providing mental health services. And thinking about new models of delivering mental health care is we're never going to get to scale if we, if we don't. So that's a big priority for me. And then in terms of your question about social emotional learning programs, elementary school programs, early childhood, investments in social emotional learning in early childhood um, are incredibly important at this point. In Good. Time. Final thoughts, resources. I want to hear like one or two resources you want to leave folks with that they can maybe easily Google since we don't have a, you know, a board where we can flash up a link and your final thought. So uh, let's just go resource, 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 final thought, final thought, final thought. In any order, jump in, go. Go. Okay, I think no matter what you do and who you are, you have a role to play. And it might start with 
simply engaging in a more deep, vulnerable conversation with the people who are in your lives, and especially people that you might be worried about. So a resource that I want to recommend is something that we created called the Real Convo Guides. It's at AFSP um, Real Convo. Um, and, and AFSP will, stands for American, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Um, and there's a host of resources there, including tips for parents, um, resources for schools, like a school district model suicide prevention policy that all school districts should be utilizing to create that culture of respect and safety. All right, I'm gonna do my resource and my final thought together real Great. fast. Um, so I put a lot of resources out there, but one of my um, things I get to do is work with UNICEF, and just yesterday on the UNICEF website, they put up my nine-point guide to how to help a teenager manage a meltdown. Fantastic. So if you search Damore Meltdown UNICEF, you will find it. Um, and in terms of final thought, I think what we really need to remember is kids and teenagers are very aware of how we are talking about them. And we need to be really mindful that they are always listening. And I worry about how it feels for them when there is nothing but hand-wringing and fear and disparagement or worry. Um, they are wildly resilient. They are growth-oriented. So I think to the degree that we are talking about the mental health crisis that is real, I think we also need to be remembering to talk about it in a way that has hope, has ideas, is forward-looking, because it's hard for teenagers to hear the conversation around them be so bleak. I, I totally agree. I, I, I want to just make a pitch for the resources that you two have described as saying these are wonderful resources. Is Adrian here, who, who was on the panel this morning? Are, are, you, are you here? Anyway, Adrian's running an organization, a Gen Z organization um, for, anyway, that is a, a youth activism organization, which is incredible. And that is one place where I would put my resources. Mm -hmm. I would also put my resources in youth activism right now. Mm -hmm. um, I would also put my resources in places like Castle that are trying to promote social emotional learning, Making Care in Common, the initiative I run, which is trying to develop relationships, places like Facing History, which are trying to also develop relationships and help people lead an ethical life and an emotionally healthy life. Yeah. And I'll add, I have a free blog, Julie's Pod. You can Google Julie's Pod. I write w roughly once a week. I have some pieces directly for parents like about three weeks ago, a parent's pledge to improve kids' mental health. When we look after our own mental health as grown-ups, mm -hmm. the mental health of the kids in our lives improves. So don't you forget that you have to look after yourself as well. We're done, we're actually over time. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking our panelists.